Hello. It's my pleasure to start off this afternoon's session with uh, Mark Walton from Northwestern University. Mark joined the Northwestern University Art Institute of Chicago Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts in 2013 as its inaugural senior scientist and as a research professor of material science and engineering at Northwestern University. In January of 2018, he was appointed as co-director of the center. Walton earned a DPhil from the University of Oxford in archeological science following an MA in art history, as well as a diploma in the conservation of works of art from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. Mark's research focuses on the trade and manufacture of objects and on developing imaging technologies in the field of conservation science, resulting in over 70 peer review articles. The title of his presentation is Immaterial, a Scientific Study into Holograms. Please join me in welcoming Mark. So th thank you, Jennifer. And also, thank you for including me in this session. I'm a little bit of a, a fish out of water for a number of different reasons. One of them is that, again, I know very little about contemporary art, but I do know a little bit about materials analysis and trying to extract information about an object just through the composition and structure. I'm also, I grew up in the 70s, and this movie, Star Wars, um, was a major influence on me. This is the famous scene, of course, of Princess Leia being projected out of R2D2 saying, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, you're my only hope. Um, but in this vision that we see here is an object made entirely out of light, viewed probably, we think it's supposed to be viewed in the round, uh, a sculptural form, yet it's not sculptural in any way that we actually think of sculpture in that it is um, something that is not additive or subtractive. And in fact, I think that Lucas and Spielberg were probably influenced by things that like this. This is a 1974 hologram produced by Lloyd, Lloyd Cross. It's now in the MIT Museum's uh, collection in which we can see a moving image of a woman blowing a kiss. Uh, you can walk around this in 3D and actually see this um, image of this woman. Um, and again, entirely produced out of light. It is a projection of the future. It is a projection of what the ideals of the 70s, 80s, and really going back into the 60s was about what the cutting edge of science was. And you would actually find this not so much in fine arts museums, but peppered in museums of science and industry at exhibits that are trying to show the latest and greatest technology that are coming out of the national laboratories within America. Um, but I want to explore a little bit about how the materiality of this, the science of this, is actually contributing to our understanding of it as an art form. This is actually a New York piece. Uh, Cartier um, commissioned this, uh, basically the string of gems that was being dangled out uh, to be able to put on his Fifth Avenue shop window. So when passerby saw it, they would see a hand projected out into the street to see this round dimensional form. And the apocryphal tale here is um, that a woman was walking by, an elderly woman who really didn't understand what she was looking at, got really angry at this work of art and started swatting her handbag at it, uh, trying to figure out what it was. But this brings up a couple of different points that we've already touched upon. One of them is this idea from Pliny the Elder, I know we just talked about him, um, about uh, this, this tale of uh, Zeus um, painting something that is so realistic, so lifelike, um, uh, the scene of grapes, that a bird's going to come back and nibble at it and eat it. Um, and also it brings up Walter Benjamin. I think that one of the um, uh, people that came before me was uh, actually spoke about Walter Benjamin. In this case, I wanted to talk about how he his notion of the uncanny, that the surprise, that the idea of this thing being in three dimensions was what actually gave the work of art value and interest. It was the shock of it, the novelty of it, that was what was actually valuable. But all artists were not interested in just the mimesis or the, 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 the visual um, um, mimicking of reality. They were interested in really playing around with this. I think this is another video I have that maybe or maybe not will play. It doesn't really matter. It's not playing. Apologize about this. 
um, in which this is a, a, um, a, a hologram by Rudy Burkhout, in which he, if you actually tilted this thing around, you would see the different perspectives of this mountain landscape receding into the distance. And so they were playing with different forms, how light, how shadow, how diffusing that light could be captured in the two dimensions of a hologram, which we'll come to understand in the next couple of slides. Again, this is another video that doesn't appear like it's playing. Oh, here we go. Chuck Close continues to play around with these forms in his own works of art uh, going between um, 1998 and 2000. This is 2017. This is actually at the end, very end of the arc of the production of holograms. And here he is still trying to explore this idea of being able to create a three-dimensional form when it comes to the understanding of his ongoing series of, of looking at uh, his own portraiture, self-portraiture. And I think that all the things that actually were intriguing and alluring about this art form are captured within these sort of images that I've been showing you, is that they provide a three-dimensional realism. They have unlimited depth of field. There are certain holograms that you can look at that go meters into the distance. They recede so far, then you can see with very sharp precision going all the way out into that deep space. They provide a depth of perception and parallax, meaning that you as a, a viewer has to move around it and you're engaged in some sort of theater or art uh, or dance when you're actually trying to engage with these sort of works of art. Um, and then I get these sort of things that I pulled out of the literature that they are luminous, they're intangible, they're material. Um, but the thing that I really wanna talk about, and it's gonna be kind of the underlying leitmotif of the entire presentation is this that these are um, objects that are made out of photographic materials, but they're not a photograph. What I mean by a photograph is something, if you take a look at a regular silver-based emulsion, you can take a microscope, view, uh, zoom in on that photograph, and look at areas that are uh, darker versus lighter. And the differences that you're gonna see, you're gonna see uh, more silver uh, particles in the darker passages, you're gonna see lighter, um, amounts of silver in the lighter passages. And you can really readily understand that there's a direct transference of the intensity of the image, the intensity of the light that's scattered off of an object, and what's actually recorded on the film. Not the case with a um, hologram. We'll see some examples of what a hologram looks like um, actually up close, but there's no real a direct transference between the material and the object that's formed. And in terms of uh, uh, the notion of functionality of an artwork, is to be able to determine what a function uh, uh, of an object is, you have to actually try to describe what it is. And this actually defines a lot of my own explanations of what uh, these sort of objects are, and then thus how they fit into the history of art, the history of materials, the history of how they're used, and how we are putting this into some sort of context to be able to understand it better. So what I'm hoping to do through the rest of this talk is basically show you the physics, and I apologize about getting into the physics because it's actually sometimes hard for me to understand and I hope that you bear with me. And actually, I think that this is one of the leading reasons why this has not been tackled by the conservation community as a whole is because it's really still in the realm of experimental physics that a lot of these things are made. So this is my nod to the experimental physics. This is how a hologram is recorded. You have some object, you have a piece of film, you take um, a what is known as a coherent light source, a laser, that is going to be used to light that object. A, a coherent light source is something that has both temporal and spatial coherence, meaning it's a single wavelength and that it's coming from some sort of point source or all the rays are parallel to one another. It hits that object, it scatters off that object, and then you're also picking that laser um, um, off away from its native beam, directing by mirrors, so it intersects again with that interference, that propagating wave front that's coming off that object, and they are then constructively interacting with one another. So what you actually have in a hologram is a image of the scattering wave front, and encoded into that, unlike our actual photograph, you not only have intensity information or amplitude information, but you also have information about phase. And what phase is, is the distance that light has traveled. And that's what gives you all the three-dimensional qualities of that work of art that we, we would like to understand a little bit better. To be able to view a transmission hologram, we can get into the other forms of this, you need to have a laser of the same sort of wavelength that's going to shine through this, and the, you as a viewer are gonna be on the other side of it. And essentially, that, that record of that scattering light front 
serves as a diffraction grating. That diffraction grating literally shapes the light in front of our eyes and gives us a three-dimensional form that we're looking at. So in this case, the three-dimensional form is actually inside the film itself, giving you a sense of the three-dimensionality of the object. If you're to take, this is directly out of the literature, if you're to take a cross-section of a film that looks like this, scanning electron microscope, we have um, a scale bar that is around five microns here. So each one of these lamellar structures that you see here are the, what is actually burned into that film that's the diffraction grating that is then playing that image back to us, just to give you a sense of what it physically looks like when you, you're, you're trying to understand the structure of, of what a hologram is. All of this comes out of work that was first conceived of by Dennis uh, Gabor, who was a British Hungarian scientist who was playing around with new ways of being able to focus light in an electron microscope. His experiment, which I, I'm going to actually impact a little bit for more in the, the slides to come, was extremely simple. You take an, a focused electron beam, you spread it out, uh, you take only the, um, the parallel rays in the center, you put an object in between. His object is actually this um, uh, transparency you see here. And by doing so, and you put a piece of film in the back plane, by shining this coherent light through this object, you're going to produce a diffraction pattern that looks such as you see here. Then by playing that same light back through it, you can get a reconstruction of the image you see right here and compares it with the original data or the original image of the object that he was trying to record. And there's a couple different problems here. You can see that the reconstruction is not perfect. Um, it does not preside the, exactly the same resolution you want, but what he did realize about it is that it, it could be useful for other things, but it wasn't realized at the time. He published in Nature. It was one of the least cited articles of that particular time period. It was actually considered to be a failure of the science going forward. And the major problem here was two things. One of them is that he didn't have a laser at the time. This predates the invention of the laser by around 12 years. And also, um, he had to deal with some natures of the physics, that when you actually produce an image in this particular configuration, you produce a twin that creates a lot of signal to noise. I won't get into that. If you want to ask me about it later, I'd be happy to discuss it. We're actually using this in my laboratory right now. We're trying to build cheap microscopes that are based on Gabor's design, which you take a CMOS sensor. This is, if anyone knows, a Raspberry Pi computer. They're ultra cheap computers. This is a $25 sensor in which we're sticking a sample down in here. We distributed some uh, pigment particles. In this case, it was cobalt oxide in um, uh, melt mount. Uh, and you can see the way that the hologram actually looks. You can see the uh, particle centers, and you can see all these diffraction rings around the outside of it. And we take advantage of the fact that we know the wavelength of light that's coming through. We're just using cheap light-emitting diodes that are shining through that object to be able to reconstruct it. We do this all digitally, of course, instead of playing it back. We do it through signal processing, where we take some sort of Fresnel kernel, which is supposed to mimic the wavelength of light that would be used to re-illuminate it. We take the Fourier transform of that, we um, do some sort of convolution kernel with that object, and then we reconstruct it at the end. And this is all to say that we can record a three-dimensional volume where we can focus through that entire object and we can bring it to a point of focus there and then uh, reconstruct the different individual elements that you see uh, within that scene. So this is ultra-cheap microscopy down to the micron level using just toys, really. Um, and what's really remarkable about this is you can think about third world applications, you can think about bringing this into an art museum to build an ultra cheap microscope. So that's kind of our motivation for doing this work. Um, the reason that I'm doing holography is I forgot to mention at the very beginning is that my co-author who's coming a lot, uh, um, is helping us develop these techniques actually worked in Steve Benton's laboratory, which was one of the forefathers of holography and has become interested in how to actually use this sort of thing for um, uh, the, the sort of concepts he's developing in the digital world to be able to help us in the conservation world. So 1948, holography is described. 1960, the first Ruby laser. And then almost immediately afterwards, two years later, we have uh, the University of Michigan, Emmett Leith, and Joris Uppetniks, who are doing the first transmission holograms. In Russia, same year, we have Yuri Dezinuk that's actually producing the first reflection hologram. So a lot of the ones that you see are just lit with white light white, and then you can see the reflected uh, wavefront coming back to you. 
um, we have the first post lasers being produced in 1967. And interestingly enough, we've already mentioned Bruce Nauman once, I'm gonna mention him again here, is that just a mere year after the invention of the post laser portrait created by Larry Siebert, um, he's actually adopting this for use in his, his works of art for reasons that I will leave the art historians to try to determine. Uh, Steve Benton, MIT, is creating things such as rainbow holograms, which is ultimately leads to the downfall, in my opinion, of holographic art. <laughs> you know the ones I'm talking about in National Geographic. Uh, 1971, Gabor gets noted for his, his discovery, largely on the basis of this new technology and art forming, making practices that were being developed. Uh, we have the integral hologram that I showed you previously. Uh, dichromate gelatin, they start to work out different ways of being able to record finer and finer fringe resolutions of that diffracted front. And then finally, we start to get things like the first embossed hologram on a credit card, the security devices you have on currency, and of course, stickers. Um, this really has a very interesting arc. So right now, we're basically 30 years from the invention to the very, basically, demise of this entire technology. We're going from something that is heralded as the cutting edge. It is being used to advertise the prowess of our national laboratories. And then by the end of this arc, it's just stickers. Um, it, 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 it's actually a, um, uh, if you talk to youth today, they will often say holograms, who really cares, because they see them so often. And this tautology, this often repet repetition of this form over and over and over again kind of demeans its place in the history of art. So in, un, in this context, we put together a collaboration with MIT's museum. And MIT has uh, arguably the best collection of holograms that exists. And we had several challenges that we were trying, and I should say at this point, is that this is a nascent project, that we're just getting started on this. So I want a lot of feedback from the audience and how to further develop this as a concept and the type of things that we should be looking at. But our three challenges that we posed for ourselves is one of them is that could we use tools, better tools, to be able to understand holographic uh, materials? Then after that, how do we actually document? We've been talking about documentation, documentation, documentation is the way to go. But there's physical limitations to what you can actually document. And this is going to be, I will show you the calculations that we're doing about the amount of information we have to collect on a single hologram to be able to reconstruct the wavefront. And then once the data is recollected, how do we then redisplay it? Uh, which is some really very significant challenges. So what we did is I went to eBay, um, and eBay has tons of holograms right now. If you want to invest in holograms right now, go to eBay and start pulling them out. I think that's moment is now. But this happens to be one of them that was just a, an extremely, extremely cheap one. Of, I think it was about 30 bucks. Um, they're mass produced. They're probably from a, a master, and it's being copied. It's a silver halide emulsion. Um, and we're asking some very basic questions as what, what are the tools and what do we actually expect to see when we do this sort of analysis. A little bit about the emulsion chemistry. I said that it is made, holograms are made of photographic materials. And this is really true here, is that we have a, uh, if you take a look at this flow diagram, is by and large the starting place is an unexposed uh, photographic plate. So you have silver halide uh, particles that are embedded through that entire structure. You expose it to the laser light, it produces point defects that you then put through some sort of development process. So you're actually creating uh, a distribution, a density of um, silver metallic particles within that emulsion film. The problem with this is that if you did this with a hologram and you're creating what they call an amplitude grating, an amplitude dark grating is very dark. And in fact, the early Denisuk holograms were, are, were people complained about them because it was, took so much light to be able to produce a three-dimensional image that you couldn't really actually see that three-dimensional structure. Instead, you have to create a phase hologram out of that. And what the physicists actually mean by that is using bleach to reconvert the silver metallic particles back to some sort of salt form. In the case here, they're looking at silver bromide as the process, so whatever it might be used. So I've seen the literature, ferric cyanide, mercury chloride as bleaching agents to be able to convert the uh, material back to its salt form, which presents all kinds of conservation issues that I think that we're only starting to uh, consider when it comes to these objects. These are just different uh, pathways that you can go through to be able to convert your thing back to a silver bromide. 
The reason that I'm showing you um, this kind of diagram of different refractive indexes is you can easily see light being absorbed by dark passage of metallic silver particle. You can't really get the light out because the refractive index is only about 0.15. But if you have gelatin versus silver bromide, then you have a little bit of more of an index matched um, uh, material, which is uh, more efficient in being able to diffract the light back out to the viewer. So first of all, we tried to throw every technique we had at it. And one of the things that we use is macro X-ray fluorescence imaging to be able to understand the spatial distribution of materials um, distributed across a work of art. We weren't expecting to see a, anything simply because we're not looking at, again, a photograph. We're looking at a distributed diffracted wavefront. And so when we're taking a look at the distribution of silver and bromine across this photograph, these are the two images that we got. Absolutely nothing, zilch, nada, for the reason that the image is actually not embedded within the material itself. So we then turn to another technique that is called optical coherence tomography. And it's a little bit about swatting um, a, a fly with a sledgehammer uh, for the reason that th this is usually used for biological uh, works of art where you're looking at changes in refractive index. You send a laser through, you're looking through for um, places which have lower and higher, where you have some sort of boundary between the two materials, which is going to produce an interference um, pattern. So here we're looking at a two-dimensional slice of that holographic film. And then we're taking a look at how the refractive index changes along one of those um, uh, pixel lines right here. Each one of these pixel lines is separated by 0.63 microns, giving you a virtual three-dimensional section of that photograph, so without actually taking a sample. And we can see a couple of really interesting things. One of them is that the entire emulsion is really quite thick, around 1.2 millimeters. You have these strange line striations that'll come back through, and an entire, this, this what we're calling the interference in the first 200 microns, I have some doubts about that, on the upper layer. And this is just around 300 micrometers across. If we take a look at this in, by playing a video and looking down through the material, this is what it looks like. Going through, you can see those sort of interference fringes, and then you get all these things that look like Fresnel zone plates. And by the way, this is the first time anyone has seen anything like this, and I'm revealing it to you here, so you should be excited about that. Uh, another three-dimensional view of this is, again, the photographic film that we reconstruct in three dimensions. You can see how we have this much more dispersed but evenly spaced material that is uh, evenly distributed through the entire film. And if we concentrate on one of those, we can see a couple of really interesting things here. One of them is that we have this kind of smearing of this, uh, the, the fringes here where we can see them more highly resolved on the other end. And then we have a number of these, what I'm calling zone plates, distributed through that entire structure. We think that this is due to the actual directionality of light that was used to illuminate the object. So we have some sort of angular dependence where that uh, light is coming through, creating a smear on one end and high resolution on the other. Again, early days, we're still trying to investigate what these structures are. If we were to compare it to some photographs that we're taking, this is actually of a Emmett Leith and Uris Upnik's uh, transmission hologram, you can see some of the same features in both of them here. This is actually a projection through that entire three-dimensional um, image where we can see the actual structure of the reflected surface. And here is what we see in the, in the original um, hologram that was produced by this artist. So we actually think that these are where light is being reflected off of the, the, the emulsion and then refocusing light at basically points within their three-dimensional uh, field of view. This poses all, so I've given you a, a, a brief look at the type of ways that we're going to be able to examine the structure of these holograms. Um, but I want to bring up some conservation challenges as we're thinking about this as a dynamically changing material. A PhD thesis out of the University of Dublin, 2016, where we have uh, the study of holograms as a really sensitive marker for changes in humidity. <laughs> So think about this for a second. It's, we're dealing with a gelatin matrix that is going to swell and change. It's going to be a dynamic object. And they're actually using the diffracted front as a way to sensitive look at color change. So as you the film, a film dehydrates or expands, you're actually going to change color and redistribute those silver ions based upon how much water you had to have entering into your system. A big problem. I never mentioned another problem with the conservation associated with the use of bleach to be able to create a more efficient diffraction grading. 
And then the big one here, and this is the one that we're really trying to think about hardest is, all right, how do we actually digitally digitize all this information? If you just take a regular eight by 10 size hologram, you illuminate it at 700 nanometers, you're gonna produce fringes that are around 0.5 micrometers. And this is actually a TE image right here of an actual hologram. If you sample this at the Nyquist limit, which means enough, enough resolution to be able to resolve the actual um, wave that you're trying to resolve, that means sampling at around 125 nanometers, which is already below the limits of what we're gonna be able to achieve optically. And then if we did scan that entire thing, we'll be dealing with something like a 900 gigapixel image. When we think about the state of the art DSLR is 20 megapixels, where, where it's an order of magnitude change with the type of information that we have to deal with. And these are the type of calculations that we're, we're trying to do to be able to translate it to the next generation of, of, of this sort of thing. So it's a huge problem that I think is currently out of the realms of possibility with the physical collection of this information. But is that the end of the story? And the answer is no. We're developing techniques in our laboratory right now, and I didn't mean this to be a pitch of what we're doing technologically, but it is sounding like that, I realize. Um, we're trying to use things such as uh, um, tychography. Tychography is coming out of the field of, of synchrotron research, where you're able to take a look at the diffracted wavefront on a point-by-point -point basis and actually collect a series of images. This it can be collected at the sort of wavelength resolutions that we're needed to do. So we're seriously looking at this as a way to circumvent actually measuring the physical three-dimensional structure of the hologram to actually collect some sort of abstracted information about how to be able to do this. And then this gets into really the work of my colleague, Ali Kosart. So once you have all this information digitized, how do you then play that back? Given the fact that a hologram is going to exist, and I hope it does, that it's going to last and be part of a material culture going forward, there is real need to be able to understand how the material is changing over that time, and some sort of digital documentation should be necessary. So we're trying to develop new techniques that are going to extend the resolution of regular LCD screens by using um, all kinds of different material science and computer science that I'm not going to get to in this presentation to be able to recreate a true visualization of what that hologram should look like, given the look, the feel, the artistic intent, the expressions, expressive nature of what a hologram is using the technology we're developing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Mark started a couple minutes late, so if we could have maybe one question from the floor. I have a really stupid question. Um, suppose you use photogrammetry, you just take a camera in front of it, rotate the laser, and record it as a digitized 3D image. Would that get you any of the information you want? Yeah, in fact, this is exactly the type of things that we're, we're looking at, that you can actually create some sort of video where you capture all the different angles of illumination to be able to approximate the information that you are recreating with the light field. The problem with this is that they, it, you're st it's a, going to be a sparse information set. You're not going to actually see everything. To be able to get the complete detailed information, all the data that can be collected through the original experiment, you have to um, collect at the resolutions that I'm talking about. So yes, they're, they're, we're playing around with that idea. All right, we'll hold further questions to the panel discussion. Let's thank Mark again.